Without further delay, I will now mute myself and hand it over to Johannes. Welcome everyone and enjoy the talk. Thank you very much, Daval, for the nice introduction. Um, I will switch to my presentation. Okay, that seems to work quite nice. Um, and thank you everyone also um, from my side to join for this talk. I will, as Daval already mentioned, talk about my master thesis research. And I have a laser pointer. And that is called antenna optimization for plasma positioning reflectometry in blanket equipped tokamaks. I'd like to start with this um, figure visualization of ITER, ITER, the planned very large tokamak in the south of France, which is to prove that uh, fusion is a viable option for energy uh, provision, electricity provision in the future. And I've put as a title ITER at Solem with some help of Google Translate. Uh, which means the way to the sun, and ITER is then also the name of, of this device, so it's quite applicable. Uh, could also be translated as the, the journey to the sun, and I think everybody who's involved in the, in the fusion research, in the fusion community, will know that it is really a journey and not a nice straight way to, to reach fusion electricity on Earth, uh, and that it's only by combining a lot of people's small efforts to, um, that we are actually able to, to get there. And uh, my research definitely can be considered small. Uh, to, no, to see the domain of it, we need to zoom in once more in this image, which was very impressive. Here we had a person for comparison, for scale comparison. Now we have a ruler, uh, a bit more boring scale comparison maybe, but just to give you an idea of the order we're talking about, um, they're only a couple of centimeters, and um, this is the, the region that's available between two of these blanket modules, which you can see here, which I used for designing this antenna, only six by three centimeters, uh, but crucial, uh, I would dare to say, for the working of a future fusion power plant. Um, I don't know uh, if everybody is, to start with, acquainted with fusion. Maybe some are thinking, Fusion, what is fusion um, anyway? Um, I don't know, maybe Ekaterina, you can have a look um, at, at our audience if, if there are people who are from outside the fusion community who would like to get a, a more broad introduction about fusion. I can give that, I have prepared that. But of course, if this is not uh, asked for explicitly, I would then uh, suggest to skip this part. Um, I know if you could give me some, some feedback on that. And then we can see how we continue from here. I think, I think you can go ahead with it, don't worry, Johannes. So I, I give the introduction? Yeah, yeah. Okay, thank you. Thanks. Okay, so then I will give some, some general introduction uh, about fusion then, to start with quite brief and we start, of course, with what is fusion? Um, fusion is the process that drives the sun. This is how it is often introduced um, to um, people studying physics in, in high school. And it's true, fusion is indeed uh, the process that drives the sun, but it doesn't really give you any idea of what it is exactly. But the name gives it away already. So fusion is literally nuclear fusion. You fuse two nuclei together, to one nucleus and this is the reaction that's happening in the sun you have two protons they fusion to fuse into deuterium giving a positron a neutrino and some remaining energy and this is according to einstein's famous esmc squared uh, the mass of these particles is not equal to the mass of these particles and the mass difference results in some energy which is released however this reaction which is dominant in the sun is not that ideal to use on Earth. And the reason for that is that it has a so-called low cross-section. This means basically that it has a very low probability of occurring. Um, so therefore it's not efficient and definitely not efficient enough for fusion on Earth for energy or electricity production. Fusion on Earth, we would use this reaction, which is written here, deuterium and tritium, which are both isotopes of hydrogen, will fuse into helium and a uh, neutron. 
and you can see that they both carry a lot of energy about one fifth in the helium and four fifth in the neutron and then here this is also visualized uh, so you have the deuterium tritium fusing into helium neutron the neutron carries a lot of energy and then hits uh, lithium this is a secondary reaction this is not a fusion reaction but it is nonetheless crucial for fusion on earth because then this reaction with lithium produces another helium but more importantly tritium again and then this tritium can be used to fuel the next reactions and this way what we can do is really fuel our reactor by the, the reactions that happened before it's it's a breeder reactor in a controlled way of course um, so this is very nice because tritium is a rare element on, on earth so, um, therefore we can keep going although we don't have that much um, tritium available on earth now fusion of course to occur has some conditions that need to be fulfilled um, first of all what we saw before this image here there are uh, cores of uh, so nuclei of molecules or of elements that are depicted and um, that means that we need to have three ions to start with we need to have not not this the classical depictioning of an element of the periodic table but we need to have separate nuclei and electrons and to do this we need to have a plasma and here i've depicted plasma as a fourth state of matter which it is often called and uh, normally this representation is not 100 percent correct because you have some assumptions as is mentioned here but it's close enough to get some first indication of, of what it means and basically what you can see here is that if you have this classical pt diagram you need to be really far far away from the the other states uh, to reach a plasma state and you don't have one ionization line you have an ionization region but the basic idea is you have a high pressure and or a high temperature and you will reach the plasma state you will have this ionization process in which the core and the electron split this however is not yet enough for fusion for fusion you additionally need to overcome repelling forces between um, the different nuclei that you want to fuse of course nuclei are always positively charged and positive charges repel each other so to make them fuse you don't just need a plasma you need to have really highly energetic particles that will overcome this uh, barrier repelling each other to fuse with each other and this representation we can retake in a different way here and uh, here i just stretched a bit the, the, the axis uh, to make some more space for the fusion region and uh, here is basically what i said before fusion will get you some power output but the plasma state or the, to reach the fusion uh, you need a large power input and so the, the basic idea is that you need to get in this corner before you can get any energy from your fusion from this mass difference out again um, and then the basic question is of course when do we get more output and input this is what we want we want to produce electricity we want to have energy output and this is um this is quantified with the q factor which is given here as the, the fusion energy so the output on the auxiliary energy which is necessary to get here the input and this needs to be bigger than one and then if you see here you see that current fusion experiments actually never reached this and that is exactly why we're building ether the device i showed you before to actually show that this q equal one is possible um, it's not really a big problem that we we didn't do this yet it's not um, that we tried and we tried and we didn't succeed this is <laughs> partly what happened but another part is that a lot of these experiments are actually looking into plasma physics and understanding how to create uh, conditions for fusion instead of actually attempting fusion a lot of these devices also don't work even with uh, tritium and deuterium but with other plasmas just to understand more the physics that are underlying it so that we can then attempt now for the first time on a really big scale um, to have fusion um, positive fusion output let's say so if we have back again ether which is a tokamak this is just uh, basically means that we have a donut um, in which the, the plasma is floating and then if you if you see this super super big device actually only in this part 
there is a plasma and here this is the region in which the plasma is and everything else here are auxiliary systems um, which first of all make sure that you reach the conditions in which fusion can occur but also they make sure that you can keep these conditions and very important that you don't touch the walls you must remember that this plasma was very highly energetic and that also means that it um, it's just super, super hot. I mean, this, this reaches core temperatures up to 150 million uh, Kelvin. So this cannot be in touch with any material. This needs to really float. And this is obtained by a magnetic confinement system, which will so stabilize the plasma, as I mentioned, um, and make sure it doesn't touch the walls and control also its shape and its position. And components of which this exists are um, basically coils uh, which drive some current and then this current causes magnetic fields and this magnetic fields make then that uh, the plasma will stay in its place. Um, also remember this is an ionized quantity uh, or an ionized state of matter rather. Therefore it has electromagnetic properties and it can be influenced by magnetic fields to for example be confined. All these coils, the side note, will be superconducting in ITER to limit their power consumption. Uh, but that also means that they need a very low temperature. So that means that here you have temperatures of a few Kelvin and here you have 150 million Kelvin. So that means that these temperature gradients here are of course huge. And to deal with that, other components are necessary. Uh, you have the first wall, which deals with the huge heat loads here. The breeder blankets, which uh, will produce the tritium as I described before. And you have some shielding for this um, very high temperature gradients, for example. And then in the end, you have a vacuum vessel to keep the, the pressures also at different levels. Uh, and these systems, together with these systems, then of course form this huge um, systems here surrounding the, the actual uh, tokamak vessel or vacuum vessel in which the plasma is contained. Um, before we move on to my thesis research, I also included these slides, which are um, a bit more a practical side of a fusion. And it's a site that is not often highlighted, but I think is also very interesting. So this is uh, another look at Q-factors. So we said before that uh, Q-factor is the, um, uh, the ratio of the fusion energy produced and the auxiliary energy necessary to reach the conditions fusion and for ITER we will aim at 10 uh, meaning 10 times more output than input as is illustrated here it must be taken into account that here this control volume over which we we put these ratios is not the complete uh, system so we saw before that there is a lot more to it than than only this and more specifically we we do not um, take into account the energy of the helium this is maybe a bit technical but um, if you remember, the fusion produced, uh, uh, the fusion of deuterium tritium gave a neutron and helium, and this helium will actually stay in the plasma, and it's only the neutron's energy that is transferred to produce electricity. And therefore, you cannot really say that this whole 500 megawatts actually leaves here. Then you don't take into account the auxiliary systems, which are these uh, things here. Also, you don't take into account the efficiency of the auxiliary systems. You only take into account some energy that goes in here for reaching the, the fusion conditions, but for example, not the cooling of the magnets uh, and not the efficiency of the systems. And therefore, if you do take this into account, um, you actually need to calculate with 100 megawatts here and 100 megawatts for the cooling system, meaning that you only get a Q prime and more engineering like approach uh, of two. And then if you would take into account the conversion from thermal energy to um, electric energy, you would come to approximately one only, meaning that this whole device with Q equal 10 um, actually doesn't produce more electricity than it consumes. So for a real power plant, what you would need is something with a larger Q factor than ITER, for example, Q equal 30. If you then have two gigawatts fusion power produced, you need auxiliary uh, input of uh, 67 megawatts. And then, um, if you translate this and then again the inputs that you actually need to run the system and you take into account the efficiencies of, um, of the conversion afterwards to electricity, you end up seeing that it only produces about 500 
a 70 megawatts output. So it's very important, in my opinion, to really not confuse this fusion energy output with uh, power plant output, because as you can see here, it's almost a factor uh, four lower. So this is just something to, to keep in mind when uh, people are talking about fusion. And then I also have here some more slides. I will skip them for the moment. Um, this is a bit about the future of fusion and the role of fusion in the energy landscape, but it's um, maybe too far from, from the subject uh, that I will continue with. And also I need to keep an eye on my time and I would really like to um, talk to you about my, my thesis research. So I will just uh, skip this for the moment if anybody would have any questions about how I see the role of uh, fusion in the future energy landscape, um, we'll be very happy to come back to this in the question part. But now let's move on to my thesis research. Um, I have here once more this uh, image of ITER. And uh, you might remember that I said that you really don't want this plasma, which is very hot, to touch the walls. And this control loop that we see here is responsible for exactly that. What we see here is that you get some reference position of where you want the plasma to be, and you get some feedback of where the plasma actually is. And then some control system here will try to make sure that this error, delta R, uh, is as close to zero as possible. You um, basically change the power supply of the poloidal field coils. This was one of these magnetic components which makes um, the magnetic field. Uh, you change the power supply there. You change that for the current in these field coils. You change the magnetic con um, field, con which confines the plasma. And therefore, you will change the plasma position. So this is this forward control uh, branch. And then you have some perturbations because you are, of course, monitoring a dynamic system. You have heating. You have turbulence in your plasma, which uh, changes this position again. And then you have uh, some feedback to provide this real position, which is uh, partly a diagnostic, measuring some quantities in the plasma, and then a reconstruction, taking these quantities which are measured and translating them into a real plasma position. What is currently used are magnetic diagnostics for this feedback loop. And uh, this, unfortunately, won't work for ITER and other um, big tokamaks, which will attempt to have actual uh, fusion with a few bigger than one. And the reason for this is that there will be a lot of neutron radiation. This is not as uh, harmful, just to clarify, as the radiation of a fission power plant, uh, and also um, has a way um, shorter half time. So it's, uh, well, there is radiation, but it's really not the same radiation uh, as for a fission plant. Anyway, this radiation will induce conductivity and will induce EMF in the diagnostic. Um, what this means is that our diagnostic won't be accurate anymore because what we will be measuring is not only what we want to measure, but also something additional, some um, noise, you could say, or perturbations caused by this radiation. So this block won't give a reliable signal to this block anymore. Second problem is in this block, there will be integrator drift. This is a known problem, which also occurs in current um, experiments but our next generation experiments will have longer time scales and then this integrator drift is worse, meaning that also here, there won't be a reliable output, basically meaning that this real position here won't be reliable. And if our feedback is not reliable, our control cannot work. And therefore, my thesis um, research is to look if we can actually replace this feedback branch by a different feedback mechanism that will then give maybe a complementary more reliable position feedback so that we can keep using this very important control loop. The system used for this is plasma positioning reflectometry, which is some radar principle um, in which you, as for most radar things, you send some electromagnetic radiation, it reflects on an object, you get it back, and then from the time of flight, you can um, calculate um, how far away this object is. And normally these are metallic objects, and in our case, this is just the plasma on which we are reflecting. And I will skip these equations here maybe and just focus on the image because uh, either you already know these equations or you don't know them and then you have more value of me explaining the image, I think. Um, here we see, uh, first of all here, dispersion relations in the plasma. And 
basically what this is is um, the dependency of the frequency of a wave and the wavelength of the wave. And in vacuum, this is a linear relation. That's why the, the speed of light is constant. And then here in, uh, in the plasma, this, this relation changes. And basically how you can interpret it is that as long as you have a wave at a certain frequency, u in this case traveling, as long as it has an intersection with this line, this wave can exist and propagate through the plasma. As soon as it does not have an intersection anymore, it will be reflected. So here, this wave, this wave can travel here through this point, yes, can travel through this point, yes, but can no longer travel here because it doesn't have an intersection with our line, with our dispersion relation, so it gets reflected. And then if we do this with a different frequency, u hat, see that this one can, for example, travel up to this place. Basically, if you will change the frequency, sweep the frequency through a range of frequencies, you will get reflections always at different positions. And these positions, which is very nice, are one-on-one -on -one linked with the density of the plasma, which is here written as n. Um, this also means that if you will switch the frequencies very fast, you can actually get, okay, this frequency is that far, this frequency is that far. So you can get a density profile reconstruction and you can actually get this line reconstructed from sending different frequencies. And that's the principle that we are using as a diagnostic to then determine where this plasma is located. In ITER, this PPR, plasma positioning reflectometer geometry, looks like this. And important quantities here are capital D, which is the opening of our antenna sending and, and receiving this uh, radiation. L, which is then the length of this blanket structure. So these are metallic structures surrounding here this, um, this antenna. Uh, so L is important. And then finally, uh, small h is important. So basically that this distance is approximately only three centimeters. And unfortunately, also PPR, just like the magnetic diagnostics, has some problems for, um, for being used in ITER. And these problems are illustrated here. We see here on the, on the left side some um, plasma. So here, there's a plasma. Excuse me, my nose is itching. Um, there's a plasma here. There's the vacuum here between the plasma and the blankets. And then you have the blankets here, the antenna here and then radiation coming out here and being reflected at the cutoff layer, returning to the antenna. And you see that this first example is very nice. Um, the rays either reflect back to the antenna or they reflect somewhere else, but uh, that's okay since um, we don't need the full wave or the full beam to return to be able to make our reconstruction. Um, we then see that if there's turbulence in our plasma, so more um, really uh, irregular um, lines of density here, then we see that these waves which we send, this radiation does not return nicely, but in this case, part of it returns and then gets reflected here at this edge, uh, at this wall rather, and then returns to the antenna only after this. And this of course is not nice. We want to measure the time of flight that is traveled to derive how far this object is. If now there is additional traveling because it, it first some weird things, then we won't be able to say, oh, it's at this distance that um, this wave was reflected inside the plasma. Even worse, in this case, you see that it reflects first, comes here, then goes back to the plasma, and then goes back here. So there's a lot of extra time delay, and um, this is definitely not easy to interpret. And this multi-reflections can be solved using neural networks. That's at least an approach which is suggested by uh, Santos and which is quite promising uh, but apart from this problem there is a different problem and this extra problem is the frequency dependency of radiation diagrams and again this might be a bit technical but uh, the idea is that we have depending on the frequency that we use and i explained before that we need different frequencies depending on the frequency we have um, a different radiation diagram which is illustrated here and this means that this radiation will sometimes go nicely uh, straight ahead. So this is the angle in which it's sent and this is the intensity. So you see at 60 gigahertz, it's quite narrow straight ahead. And then at 30 gigahertz, you see that it's already a lot broader so that you don't send the radiation in the same way. And this means that our diagnostic, our measurement equipment is changing its behavior while we are taking our measurement. And 
in this specific case, also because of these effects that we see here, this is very negative because it means that we are not able to uh, really say which effects are caused by the change of our behavior and which effects are caused by the changes in the plasma. And this decoupling is very difficult if you have this behavior. So what I was investigating is if it's not possible to simply make an antenna which doesn't have this changing behavior so that all the changes are contributed to actual changes of our system and not of our measurement device. To do this, I built the R2P2 code, which the Volo already mentioned briefly. It's a ray tracing code, which means that it solves the um, uh, Maxwell equations using ray tracing approximation and also the simulations that we saw before. These are uh, results of my R2P2 code, which nicely illustrate also effects that were predicted in different studies. Um, I simulated with this a lot of different antenna designs, uh, different frequencies, different turbulence levels to basically see what the effect of these things is on the, on the performance of the antenna. And then I did 400 simulations at, uh, at each of, for each of this combination of antenna, frequency, turbulence level, so that I was able to get a statistical interpretation of the results. In total, I did more than 100,000 simulations to see basically which antenna is better than another uh, at different uh, criteria. And um, these three uh, conclusions are the main conclusions from this. First of all, frequency independent antennas, which is what I'm aiming for here, uh, can have a good PPR performance. This is a very positive first result. Secondly, we found that uh, fundamental Gaussians, which is a specific type of beam pattern, uh, have the best performance. And thirdly, that a larger aperture, so a larger antenna size, improves, uh, improves the performance of the antenna. So with this in mind, I could design or suggest an optimal design for an antenna. It has to be fundamental Gaussian, frequency independent, and of course needs to respect also the constraints that uh, the space available puts. Um, this means that we have 30 millimeters, so three centimeters only, minus some mounting tolerances, and suggested was um, by, the, by the ITER design team to take D equal 14 millimeters, so quite a small antenna. And this here is the, uh, the pattern that, that I generated. And then the question is, of course, can this be made? So far, all of this is just theoretical. So we don't know if this is actually possible to, to create such a thing. To see that, I used uh, Profusion Optimization. This is a code package developed by Burkhard Plaum at the University of Stuttgart. Um, and uh, this is the method which is used, not that important maybe here. But what is important is that there's no guarantee to find a good optimum. So if you give quite uh, strict constraints, it might be that this code does not find an actually good solution for your problem. And this was also the case for me. I had to actually to, I had to loosen my, my criteria a bit, my constraints, so that I increased uh, this diameter, the maximum allowed diameter to 20 millimeters. And then I found a very, very good antenna, uh, which has very nice overlap with the optimization goal, which I showed before. And then uh, this is something else that I tested is actually like, what if your input here at the antenna is different? What if this contains higher order um, electromagnetic modes. And then the effect of this was found to be quite negative, meaning that if you have this higher order modes, which will be present in ETEF most likely, you get offsets in the radiation diagram, meaning that this diagram, maybe I can draw this on quickly, will be moved to be more shifted to one side, for example, uh, which is negative because then also here, it would mean that it goes in this direction instead of in this direction, and then you get more of these effects. So it's very important that I also tested this so that I was able to also then do some recommendations on uh, how to mitigate these problems. Okay. Then we built this antenna. So this is a 3D version of this uh, design, and we built this as well as a reference antenna with the same size, and then I did some measurements, basically by placing this antenna here, and then moving a different antenna around it, and then connecting it to a network analyzer so I could measure how much power is radiated in different directions. And with this, I obtained these results and they are very nice results. We see that with the optimized antenna, we clearly have a very approximately frequency independent um, 
result. And with the reference antenna, we clearly do not have a frequency dependent result. And this is very, very nice. However, there's a catch here. And the catch is that the actual uh, placement of the antenna won't be just like this, just the antenna, also illustrated here, but will be between blanket structures, uh, which we discussed already before. And if I introduce these blanket structures in my measurement setup, we saw that this nicely frequency independency that we had here uh, disappears. And that uh, is partially to be expected, of course. Uh, also, this effect did not disappear if I change the length of these blankets, which was uh, an option that maybe there's like some, some better results if the antenna is a bit closer to the plasma or a bit further. But unfortunately, this was not the case. Even more so, here we saw very strong asymmetries uh, due to some small mounting tolerance, uh, mounting imperfections, which will also be present in the actual ether mounting probably. So um, this means both that the blankets really influence the result, uh, the resulting pattern, make it no longer frequency independent and that the mounting tolerances which are there for ETA might be causing um, a symmetry in the radiation meaning again that these uh, multi-reflections that I spoke about uh, will be more present and will make uh, the reconstruction more difficult. Nevertheless it was um, very good research to build further on and I can make a lot of research recommendations based on this research. First of all, uh, there could be a second optimization done which includes the environment in which the antenna is put so that um, these effects are anticipated already in the optimization and uh, that way normally it should be possible to make a frequency independent antenna which <clears throat> is then really frequency independent in this environment. Then, as I mentioned, there should be a study on the misalignment and mounting tolerances because this is really something that needs to be taken more into account. There should also be a study on thermal expansion effects. This, for the same reason as what I said before, uh, thermal expansion can change the environment, and when the environment changes, there might be misalignment, and then again, this change of direction uh, and asymmetry in the diagrams. Finally, of course, it should be looked if there can be maybe a little bit more space for the for the antennas or if the blanket shapes can be changed is something that I didn't go into detail on, but it's also a, a conclusion of different studies that this might be beneficial for the performance of this type of antenna. So the conclusions, uh, frequency independent radiation patterns with good PPR performance are possible for this application. So it's uh, one of the results of the R2P2 code. Second result of the R2P2 code was that fundamental Gaussians with the large aperture have the best PPR performance. And this was then also what I used for my antenna. Um, I was then able to also really, so design this broadband frequency independent PPR antenna. And finally, uh, we found with uh, experiments that the antenna design should consider already the whole environment and that this should be a subject of further research. I thank you for your attention and I'm sure that there are a lot of questions. Uh, feel free to ask them. Um, I will be here and also I think uh, Daval might uh, mention that as well that after the questions we can also still hang out a bit longer um, to have some more informal discussion about fusion, the fusion community and things like this. Thank you for your attention once more. Thank you very much uh, Johannes for the wonderful talk. Uh, I now uh, open the session for questions and answers. I'm pretty sure there will be questions. I have some. <laughs> uh, uh, in the meanwhile, I will promote all the participants to, to panelists so that uh, the interaction is much more smoother. Uh, and as usual, we, we prefer that uh, the hand raising option is used uh, in order to, to make sure that uh, there is no chaos. Um, so, do we have a question? Okay, in the meanwhile, um, I have a question, Johannes, and that's, that's regarding the, the interaction of the, of the radiation that you, use, you want to use to probe the positioning to do the measurement, 
reflectometry, don't you think it it could actually hamper or perturb not only the plasma but also the the neutrons? For example, the neutrons that are uh, produced through the reaction uh, through the fusion reaction. And do you consider also this could also affect eventually the performance of your uh, detector? Okay, thank you for the question, Deva. Um, so there, there's two things actually in the, in this question. I would say first of all um, is the question: Do I consider stray radiation, uh, which I did not in this model? Um, so there, there's no consideration of radiation coming from, for example, neutrons, um, which could affect the measurement. That is is definitely true, and is something which uh, should be studied. But it's very complex. I was also discussing this with my promoter, Stefano Rowe, uh, from the University of Nancy. And uh, we were both of the opinion, and he is one person with very uh, long experience already on simulations, um, that this would be so difficult because you would need to simulate um, a full wave simulation of both the antenna environment, which is already very heavy in full wave simulations because you have this, these blanket structures. Um, which have quite a big spatial uh, domain. In addition, you need to consider the, the plasma with its turbulence uh, so that you can also consider radiation uh, caused by, by the plasma. And you would have to consider neutron radiation to, co to have a good model of the stray radiation. Um, luckily, there's no strong interaction of the, um, I would say, of the, of the probing um, waves with the plasma because these probing waves are really very low intensity. Uh, we're talking about just one watt or something. This is really not, um, not that important. So it would be maybe sufficient if you have just a very good plasma stray radiation model and then combine it with... Um... Okay. Looks like we, we don't have questions. So thanks a lot. Johannes, for the wonderful talk. Uh, I'm pretty sure we have learned something new and it's quite an interesting approach that uh, you introduced today. I had not imagined, to be honest. And uh, we hope uh, to see you around in the community and also on the platform. Thank you. With well. this, uh, I wish you all a nice evening. Uh, we will stop the recording now, but if you want to interact uh, with Johannes, uh, feel free to stay on. Thanks a lot.